Matt Llewellyn will be first coming up. Let me bring uh, Matt Llewellyn up first. Matt is a transportation and bridge leader, senior project manager with Burgess and Nipel, who is one of our exhibitors here. He has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering and a Master of Business Administration from West Virginia University. He's grateful for the opportunity to have managed many projects, including the renovation of the century-old Market Street Bridge over the Ohio River and the rehabilitation of the New River Gorge Bridge. And uh, uh, Graham wanted me to mention that he wanted to raise that point yesterday when he was showing the New River Gorge Bridge because Matt was instrumental in that project and we all got a chance to walk the, the uh, what do you call that, the, the walkway underneath the catwalk, the catwalk underneath the bridge. Yeah. Pretty exciting when you look 800 feet down to a, to a little river there. So, And uh, this year Matt was elected to the Joint Transportation Committee for the West Virginia, that's the American... Consulting Engineers Council. Okay. okay, so let's uh, let's welcome Matt. He's going to talk about the, the rehabilitation of the Thurman Bridge. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak to y'all uh, about the award-winning Thurman Bridge Preservation Project. The Thurman Bridge is close by the New River Gorge Bridge that we've been talking about. M many of you remember that, and, and Graham, Graham we, we would be delighted to, to host another tour across there. I know you mentioned that yesterday. So Thurman is just upstream of the New River Bridge. So if you guys were there, uh, you can't see it. It's not the bridge that's close by there, but it is, uh, it is upstream of New River. It's also close to uh, one of the new facilities in West Virginia. It's called the Summit Bechtel uh, Boy Scout reserve and it's a 14,000 acre facility that hosts summits every other year of about 40,000 45,000 attendees so a nice asset there as well and then the New River Gorge is now a, a new national park uh, so Thurman's kind of situated in between all of this so uh, important part of the area the town of Thurman was was founded in the 1800s and they they started out and had a really, really busy business district with railroads coming in. Uh, trains, about 10 different trains would come in a day. So they had this busy business district on the north side of the river. But on the south side, there was some, some land that was available uh, that could be developed. So they decided at that time to build a, a, a three-span pin-connected truss to get to that south side and open it up. And one of the facilities that was built was the Dunglen Hotel, and it was notorious for having good times there. And it's known for having the world's longest poker game. So uh, about 14 years that poker game took. But sadly, in 1908, they suffered a large flood. It washed out this three-span bridge. and they decided to, to build back. There you can see the, the, the Dunglen Hotel. It's underneath of the bridge if you're looking through. But they decided to build back this single span truss. It's a little bit heavier uh, steel and you can see it's, it's skewed across the end. See how the, the impost is kind of warped there? So it was unique because of that. And then also we had seven spans of deck girders that were built in and in between the old masonry stone piers they built concrete piers in 1915. So you can see th this new structure that's in place uh, in the photograph here with, with the depot. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's the new bridge that they put in. That's the one we're dealing with now. It does have an uncommon configuration, we like to say, because it supports a roadway as well as a railroad. So off of these girders and trusses, we have a, a cantilever bracket that, that supported a timber roadway originally. Fast forward to 1982, and WVDOT got involved and said, well, we're going to take ownership of the roadway side. And, uh, we're going to strengthen it and make it a little bit wider, too, so uh, we can get bigger trucks across there. So DOH takes ownership of the, of the roadway side, but CSX has ownership of the railroad side. And to further complicate matters, we have R.J. Corman, who operates their trains on the railroad side and leases from CSX. So the Thurman Bridge, it is part of the Thurman Historic District. It's showing you how it's a one-of-a-kind, unique structure. The tourism coming to that refurbished depot is about 7,000 visitors every summer. It's an Amtrak station, 
drops Boy, Boy Scouts off. They go up to the reserve. So, uh, you know, really critical to the area to have this crossing in place. And if we talked about replacing the structure, dropping a new pier down into the new river, it's very environmentally sensitive. That would take years and years to, to get approved. So it was, it was a good candidate to be rehabilitated. So BNN is known for our uh, industrial rope access skills. We were able to get out there, get a really good hands-on inspection with this bridge without having mechanical access equipment. We, we made a prioritized list of, of defects that were out there, and there were a few things that were in critical condition, and several in poor. One of the critical condition items was this upstream truss bearing at Pier 1. Yeah, this is a roller nest, so the, the rollers rolled out, and they were previously vertical underneath this bolster, but when they rolled out and dislodged, that, that allowed that bolster to drop down about an inch and a quarter, which you know, redistributes load and is not a good situation. So something we definitely wanted to be able to get repaired. The existing structure was posted at 12 tons and we started talking to RJ Corman about the size of trains that were running across. It was equivalent to a Cooper E60. And they also went across it at a slow rate, you know, at a slow speed. So that allowed us to reduce the amount of impact, reduce the loading. And when you're looking at, at, at a combined roadway and railroad bridge, you got to think about the railroad members uh, and, and rate them in a unique way. I mean, you've got to fix the, the roadway load, so use it H12, which represents the normal loading on the roadway side, and then solve for what's the biggest Cooper E train that we can take across. And then you do the reverse and you fix the Cooper E60 train and solve for what's the biggest uh, truck that we can drive across. So we also rated the roadway side of the bridge and uh, came out with nine tons was the controlling rating for the stringers and the brackets. Uh, there had been section loss there that, that brought this rating down and also field modifications, but things that we knew that we could retrofit and restore that capacity. So on the on the railroad side, it was the stringers had a long unbrace length and uh, the controlling rating was a Cooper E52. So you can imagine on this kind of a bridge that not only strength that we're worried about, but also stability. So when we looked at this, we said, well, we'll do like all good consultants do and build the 3D finite element analysis so that we could really figure out what was going on and, and make sure that we had good stability. We checked for local buckling and, and it was about a, a factor safety of 2.0, did our code checks there and, and everything was fine. Uh, but we also needed to check for global lateral buckling which is more of the twisting of the entire system. So um, when you have that, it's because these large torsional loads from the brackets are kind of pulling on that girder system. But luckily we had plenty of bracing in here. It was, it was actually pretty stiff on these girder spans and the magnitude of the loading wasn't that high. So we were okay in the global lateral buckling sense. So you guys might have saw us earlier at, at one of the last breaks. We've, we've been uh, playing with the, the Oculus goggles and that's because, I mean, you see 3D modeling used in design and, and for load rating, but it's starting to move more into inspection and maintenance. You know, we're talking about digital twins, using 3D videos. So uh, having as th this Oculus goggles where you can go in and make annotations in there about the defects that you're seeing uh, just would allow owners to, to get a better perspective of, of the defects that are on a bridge. So that's something that we've been experimenting with. I know other companies are too. If, if you get a chance at the next break, you want to come by our booth and try out the, the Oculus. It's kind of fun to play with, virtual reality. So the problem that we did have was uplift at the, at the downstream bearings down here. So you can look in the table here. If you can see it, there are some negative numbers. Even under dead load, we were seeing uplift. So that was concerning. And we would put an H20 lane load on there, we were seeing 100 kips of uplift. So I started looking at it a little bit closer and said, well, what if we just put a, a, a you know, an everyday truck out there? We reduced the rating to three tons. And what kind of uplift would we have at that point? Let's just do a simple statics problem and, and not worry about the model right now and, and solve for what kind of uplift we would get at this bearing. Well, yes, we still had uplift there, and it wasn't that much, just about four kips uh, net uplift. And so, you know, you have anchor bolts that could take that kind of uplift, right? Should have anchor bolts to take that kind of uplift. No, we don't have anchor bolts. Uh, you know, Thurman Bridge had, had a lot of debris on the bearings for quite some time, and so 
at this particular location, we were experiencing about 14 kips of dead load uplift, and all four anchor bolts are gone. So we start looking closer and say, well, there's about 40 anchor bolts across the structure that need to be replaced. We have frozen expansion bearings, uh, pack rust that's keeping the bridge from functioning like it normally would, lots of section loss in these, these girder bearing areas, and you know, fixed bearings that are now becoming expansion bearings, and you know, the ends of the girders are coming in contact. You know? So just not functioning like it should, and you know, pushing stresses to anchor bolts, popping off spalls because there's getting extra stress in those areas. You're probably sitting there wondering, okay, Matt, well, if there's, <laughs> if there's uplift and there's no anchor bolts, what's keeping this bridge from turning into the river, flipping over into the river? So we came up with a few theories of alternate load paths. We talked about these brackets. There's a few of them that extend out over top of the piers, and they have these vertical posts here, and that would help resist a little bit of the overturning. Uh, only at three low locations. And we also have these continuously welded rails that go clear across the bridge, and they act like straps, basically, that would pick up a little bit of a load from the adjacent spans if it started to overturn. And then uh, the same way, the guardrail acts like a connector across the spans and might help us have some continuity in between. So obviously aren't things that you would want to uh, rely on for public safety, right? But maybe some explanation of why our analysis was valid. And so we took all this great information, went with to WVDOT and, and, and RJ Corman and said, hey, we probably need to do something temporarily. What do you think about putting a cable over these girders and anchoring into the face of the pier uh, just so that we can get a, a three-ton posting? And, and RJ Corman liked that idea. They had some squiggly clamps. They put the squigglies on the bottom flange and anchored into the face of the pier, and we were able to keep it open while we uh, design the more permanent uh, retrofits. We were also talking to the National Park Service at the same time about some of the uh, upgrades they wanted to see with this project. It seemed on um, busy holiday weekends they would have a lot of visitors that came to the depot but very limited parking on this side so they had a overflow parking lot on the south side and the visitors would come across the bridge deck and visit the depot. But if you look at this, there's only about 12 foot of width. So if you had a vehicle there and the pedestrians at the same time, it wouldn't be that safe. The other thing they didn't like was the, the rushing white water of the new river going underneath the bridge and you have an open grid deck. Some of the visitors didn't like that feeling of, of looking through and be able to see the white water underneath. So you immediately go, well, we'll just go ahead and add a at an upstream sidewalk, we'll tack on to this and be able to do that. Well, we just talked about how there's stability issues, probably not a good idea to put a cantilever on a cantilever. So what about going to the downstream side? We could look at that, come from the parking lot, go underneath, wrap around, and then get on to the downstream side. It would balance out the loads nice and cross over the tracks to the depot. Well, start talking about it more and it's structurally feasible but uh, we have a, a elevation gain here so we'd have to ramp up and the type of visitors that come out there uh, some are elderly it probably wouldn't work out too well with them and we would have the trail in the flooded area and there'd be some maintenance involved with that and then when we get to the other end this this downstream walkway would have to cross over the end here where the truss is not great sight distance to see an oncoming train there's also a junction in the track with the main line here. Railroad was not really excited about us adding that, that crossing there and it was also a significant cost to the project. So back to the drawing board, what other better ideas do you have here? Well really what is the problem? Uh, the problem we're seeing is you know we, we don't want to see this whitewater so let's do a half gr filled grid deck um, with lightweight concrete to block that view and then let's go and take out the railing at just for a six foot length here and put in basically a, a little balcony or a refuge bay where people that could move out of the way of oncoming traffic it's pretty low ADT uh, you could just move out of the way and take refuge so we started talking to the state about this and you know it would provide some unique vantage points and it'd be aesthetically pleasing and and only be located every 200 feet and not really add that much weight to the structure if we use lightweight materials and it would reduce the overall construction cost. So that's how we proceeded. 
and sat down, started talking about the plans, right? We've got through the study phase. Now we're going to start developing some details. And states like Matt really like your study, but uh, you know we don't have that much money to to rehabilitate this bridge. You really need to focus on what are the structural capacity concerns and what are the safety concerns, and we'll just address those you know we want it to look good and we know you do too but uh any of those cosmetic repairs we need to we need to cut those so first thing that went was the concrete patching the crack sealing and the coating of the substructure units they are wall type piers so they had pretty good strength we took cores and tested those so we knew that we we had good supports there uh, we also needed to focus on that temporary support and jacking of the girder spans and, and replace the barriers, get it anchored for uplift. We had a lot of steel repairs that needed to be made, and some of those were very critical, so we couldn't cut those, but we focused on the most critical ones. And then when it comes to doing a full clean and paint of the structure, you know, this bridge has been here for a long time, and a lot of the places didn't have deterioration that were ongoing, you know. Just certain areas had the deterioration. So we decided to do a zone paint uh, of, of those repair areas, of those deteriorated areas. R.J. Corman, they ended up and said they would help by replacing the wing walls. So that was good. Timber wing walls. So we were able to make a project out of it. We moved into the construction phase, and there are permanent residences in Thurman right now. There's just a few of them there. We knew that we would need to close it to live load for a few of the repairs, so we came up with uh, nine three-day closures uh, periods that we would need to have. And so we coordinated with the residents, with the, with the depot there, and, and put the residents up in hotels during that time frame, and also hired a security guard to be in town while they were gone. So ended up working out okay. So this is interesting. Look, this is the newer concrete pier compared to the older sandstone pier. And the sandstone pier is in good condition and obviously poor on the concrete pier. So those, those st st stone masonry units that we have around the state of West Virginia are really great assets for us. Uh, nice to see those uh, be able to be reused. But we needed to work on some of the concrete piers. Uh, some of these bearing areas were just generally soft and crumbly, I call it. So we wanted to remove that loose material and inst install two-inch diameter cord holes all the way through the, the pier, and then do a concrete jacket all the way around, encase it, confine that deteriorated concrete, and then put post-tension rods through here to really just seal it up, hold it there tight confine it and it gives us a really good place to do the bearing repairs be able to jack that superstructure that was the main concern coming in here and be able to jack on that edge when you had deteriorated seat so this is a look at the girder bearing repairs uh, the contractor elected to put in uh, temporary tie downs this is looking down you can see where it's anchored anchored on the face of the pier and then anchored to the girder loosen that nut as you're jacking it up because you know the footprint gets smaller and you have that overturn concern still it was really hard work for the iron workers down at, down at their feet trying to remove rivets and get those angles off, but ended up with this nice thickened angle assembly. So anchor rods that go in supported by elastomeric bearings. One of the things that we ran into was uh, when we removed the bearings and removed these angles off the bottom, you could see that there was uh, some roughness here or some spalling, and even though that the, the area adjacent to that looked pretty good during our inspection. Underneath of the bearings, it was, it was softer. So just something maybe to account for in the future uh, is that you're going to have some patching that goes in underneath those bearings after you take them off. But to anchor the uplift, we used inch and three quarter inch diameter rods that are eight foot long, cord those in and grout them into place. The truss bearing that we talked about earlier that was dislodged and, and settled down there. Um, I went out there that night. It was a pretty interesting night. You're, you're putting dual 150-ton jacks underneath of the truss, 226 foot long, and you got the edge of the concrete pier that's right here. It's a 100-year-old concrete pier. Uh, and so we were most concerned about this pin that had been rotated and froze that way for a long period of time. So the contractor, he came out and he bathed this pin in penetrative fluid for a couple weeks.
prior to the jack to try to make sure that it was going to rotate back into place. So we were concerned about that. I was there, I was watching the concrete, trying to make sure nothing was going to happen, and, and jacked it up. And, and luckily, under its own weight, that big bolster just rotated back into place. So big success for the project, no issues, no, no change orders related to that, uh, that bearing jack. So you can see we put in a new plate here, and then the elastomeric bearings are underneath of that new plate. A lot of you deal with horizontal shear planes that have section loss. This is what we did on Thurman. We just uh, came in, drilled some oversized holes in a plate that would slide over the rivet holes here, and then we took one, bolt, one rivet out and put one bolt in, and then there's a plate washer that goes over type of that oversized hole. So we use that in several places. This is the lower lateral bracing replacement as well. Uh, we like to use photographs in our plans. It really conveys the message of the contract contractor what he needs to do. So we'd just be review, removing these batten plates and then installing a new cover plate to, to take up for this section loss that was here on this lower cord. This is a repair of a, of a bottom flange of a girder where the bottom cover plate just didn't extend far enough and we wanted to take it out a little bit farther to increase the bending capacity. Use that same method with the plate washers. Here's a look at the new refuge bays. We used FRP members that were bolted to the bottom flange of the steel stringers and cantilevered out. Uh, lightweight FRP decking and lightweight railing. Um, we also filled this grid up uh, so that they, the pedestrians could walk on that. So overall, the, the project was completed on time. Uh, within budget, had about 6% change orders, which isn't really too bad for a big re rehabilitation project. The construction team was Advantage Steel. b and was on site to help with some of the repairs, assist the District 9 uh, construction folks out there. Overall, I mean, we did address the critical needs of the bridge at the time, increased that load capacity, made sure it was stable and safe for pedestrians. People can go down there and enjoy the depot and, and not have to worry about getting hit by a truck. Uh, and tourism overall was supported well uh, from this project. So successful project and I uh, do appreciate y'all's time and, and uh, attention here and open it up to any questions you might have. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.